Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. I have another review video for you today. We're gonna to talk about a mini PC. This one is the HX99G. And honestly, I'm not really sure if I should be calling this a mini PC or like a MIDI PC, because it is kind of big, as you can see. It does take up a little bit more space, but I do like the fact that it has this little stand right here, which when you put it on your desk, doesn't take up a lot of space. And so I think altogether, yeah, maybe let's just call it a mini PC. Now I've reviewed a lot of mini PCs on this channel. In fact, I've probably done about 20 at this point, but I've kind of slowed down over the past couple months. And so let me explain why that is here really quick. Number one is the fact that after getting through a lot of my preliminary reviews, I didn't have a lot to say about mini PCs in general because they were all so very similar. I've even gone back and made a spreadsheet to kind of go over every single mini PC that I've reviewed at the different price points and what kind of performance you can expect. And so that kind of just sums up everything. And as you'll see in each of the different price points, it gets very similar. And so there was a point a couple months ago when I was making a review and I thought to myself, I'm a little bit bored with this whole process. And if I'm bored with it, then the viewers might be as well. So I wanted to spice things up a little bit as well. And so the biggest thing for me was that I started to change up when it was I was gonna accept a mini PC to review. And so after a lot of consideration, I've decided to kind of put them into three different chunks. The first one is going to be those that are at the very low price model. I really like the idea of having a mini PC that you don't spend a lot of money on, but get some surprising performance out of it. And so that's always gonna be a category that I think I'll be interested in. The nice thing about that lower price point is that as the years go on, we get better performance for same or lower prices. And so that's really exciting to me. The second category for me is going to be what I call like the value tier. That's going to be between 300 and maybe $500. And for me, I want this to be able to play just about everything, but still not be super expensive. At the end of the day, what I'm looking at from this point is something that can compete with the price of a full console like a PS5, but give you a lot more gameplay and a similar kind of experience. Now, the third tier is the one we're going to be reviewing here today, and that's going to be those mini PCs that are a little bit of a higher price, but they can be a full on desktop replacement. For example, with this one here, it actually has a graphics card inside. And so because of that, as you'll see later in the video, we're gonna get some performance that is desktop class. And that's pretty awesome, especially considering the fact that this thing is pretty portable and small as well. Anyway, that's kind of what I'm thinking about when it comes to mini PC reviews. I'm gonna do the very low tier ones, those that are really affordable, but get some surprising performance. Then also that middle tier, which is basically a console replacement. And then finally our high end tier, which I would consider to be a PC replacement. Anyway, we got a lot of ground to cover here with the HX99G. And so without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, to start, let's talk about pricing. Now it was $980 for the review model that I'm looking at here today. That comes with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. If you have your own RAM and storage, the price will go down quite a bit, $840 for the bare bones package. And of course, if you wanna go all the way, you can get 64 gigs of RAM and a terabyte of storage for about $1,200 altogether. Now you can order this directly from Mini's forum, but they also now have this one available on Amazon. And at least as of recording this video here, it's $1,269, but with a $250 coupon. Additionally, that price is for the 32 gigabyte RAM model. This is actually cheaper on Amazon than it is on their website right now. So I would recommend shopping between the two to find the best deal. Now, in terms of specs, they have this all outlined on their website and they kind of explained it better than I could. But let's go ahead and point out some of the basics. Number one, we have the AMD Ryzen 9 6900 HX CPU. Now this does have its own inbuilt graphics, but like I mentioned before, this has its own graphics card as well. It's using the Radeon RX 6600M, which is a laptop graphics card. Additionally, they've gone all out when it comes to connectivity. So we have an M.2 slot that is PCIe 4.0. In addition, the RAM is dual channel DDR5 and clocked at 4800 megahertz. And when it comes to mini PCs, these are the fastest components you can get right now. This also comes pre-installed with Windows 11 Pro. And one of my favorite things here is that they've upgraded the back IO. On the HX90G, which I reviewed a couple months ago here on this channel, it had two display ports as well as two HDMI ports. And one of my biggest complaints was the fact that it didn't have USB-C ports on the back. And what they've done here is they swapped out those display ports for two USB 4 ports instead. And these USB 4 ports are capable of video out. So we're gonna be able to get 8K resolution at 60 Hertz from those. So I would say that's a really nice upgrade overall. And if you wanna read more about the specs and the differences between these two models, I'll have this all linked in the video description below. 
But I think we should move over to the sexy stuff, which includes the unboxing and impressions. Number one, the box here is pretty darn big, but again, this mini PC is rather large too. Inside, we will get a quick manual that'll go over all the components and how to disassemble everything. Additionally, inside, we have a rather large power supply. This is 262 watts altogether, and physically, it's also pretty large too. So not the most travel friendly of power supplies, but all the same, it packs a lot of wattage as well. Also inside, you'll get the HDMI cable and then also the stand that I showed here in the intro. This has a carbon fiber design to it. Honestly, it looks more like a race car than a stand for a mini PC. Anyway, it also comes with the screws and the attachment for the stand. And this is what it looks like right here. The front is well ventilated with two fans, but then each of the sides also has some good ventilation as well. On the front, we have some IO that is relatively basic, but also very functional. We've got a power button, then a USB-C 3.2 port, and then also dedicated microphone and headphone jacks here on the front. And then finally, we have a USB-A 3.2 port and a very small CMOS reset button. I would say the overall design here is pretty busy. We have these hexagon shapes along each side, and then everything is flanked by that carbon fiber design as well. And like I mentioned, there's quite a bit of ventilation on each of the sides too. Let's take a look at the back. We have the power port right here, and then we have two HDMI ports capable of 4K at 60 Hertz. And like I mentioned, they've upgraded to USB 4 ports right here on the back. And then finally, we have three USB-A 3.2 ports and then the 2.5 gigabit ethernet port. Now to tear it down, you're gonna have to remove these rubber pads right here, which will reveal four different screws on the bottom. And these are just Phillips head screws and come right out. From there, you can pop off the plastic cover by pulling on one of the corners. And from there, we will find a metal bracket secured by four Phillips head screws. Now we can finally get a glimpse at the back of the motherboard. One thing you may notice is that they're using a heatsink here with both RAM sticks. And I've heard there's been issues with other Minis forum PCs and that the RAM has been getting too hot. Additionally, as usual, they have a heatsink on the M.2 drive as well. And then finally, we have our Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip right here. Now looking at the RAM sticks, you can see that there is some thermal paste right here, but if we peel it off, you can see we are using Kingston RAM. For the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip, they're using the typical MT7921K, which means it's capable of Bluetooth 5.2 and then Wi-Fi 6E. And just to verify with the M.2 drive, yes, 512 gigs and Kingston branded as well. Now on this side of the motherboard, we also have another M.2 drive right here. And so if you wanted to expand the storage, it's gonna be relatively easy to do. And really that's about it when it comes to expansion. So there's no SATA drive slot or anything else like that. Now this device can lay on its side, but installing the stand is very simple too. You're gonna to use five screws to attach the bracket to the PC, and then another four screws to attach the stand to the bracket. And this is what it looks like right here. It has a bit of an aerodynamic design to it. Honestly, I'm not a huge fan of that. It just feels more like a spaceship than a computer, but to each their own and it does work pretty well. Now in terms of sizing, this is a relatively large mini PC. As you can see here, it's about five sticks of grass fed butter altogether. For a more useful comparison, here it is on my studio desk. This is a 32 inch monitor, but as you can see right here, yeah, it doesn't take up a lot of space at all on the desktop. And of course, if you wanted to get creative, you could fasten it to the bottom of the desk and you wouldn't even see it at all. Either way, as far as mini PCs go, especially those with discrete graphics card, this is one of the smallest that you can find today. And I think it does look pretty clean here on the desk. Now as another comparison, here is a table or gaming shot. This is a 26 inch screen right here. And as you can see right here, it's still relatively small. In fact, it's quite a bit smaller than say something like the Xbox Series S. And so if you wanted to have this set up next to something like your Xbox or PS5, it would be much smaller than those and quite powerful at the same time. For example, right here, I'm playing Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1080p with balanced settings and we're getting way over 60 frames per second. But I'm getting ahead of myself when it comes to gaming performance. Let's do a couple benchmarks first. Number one, I like to look at the idle thermal. So as you can see right here, we're getting about 45 degrees Celsius when not under a heavy load. But when using Cinebench, which is a CPU intensive task, this is gonna push all the CPU cores to 100%. And after about five minutes right here, you can see the temperature readouts are about 74 degrees Celsius at max. And that's actually an impressively low number for the amount of load that we're putting on the machine. And there's a few things at play when it comes to the cooling system. Number one, we have those two fans I showed earlier, but then also they have a huge heat sink inside and then seven copper heat pipes as well. And to top that off, they're using liquid metal for their thermal cooling. And so with all of these combined, we are getting some very good cooling for this small PC. And in addition, the device still runs very quietly. Let me give you a test right here. Now in my comments, some people have asked me to use a mouse click to show the relative overall noise altogether. 
And so I'm going to put my mouse right next to the microphone and also click it so you can get a comparison between the two. So yes, I would say this is a very quiet mini PC given the amount of power that we have inside. Now, after the 10 minute Cinebench test, you can see the overall score here is 13,161. Now those numbers might not mean anything to you, they certainly don't mean anything to me, so let's do a quick comparison here. And so here's my footage from the HX90G Cinebench from a few months back. Number one, we can see that the overall temperature readings are much higher, in fact we're getting 90 degrees max on the CPU load. And this is even running at 45 watts, so 10 watts lower than the HX99G. And between the two, the overall score is just about the same. We got 13,207, so a little bit higher. Now for today's HX99G, I also did a time spice score. You can see here it's 8217. And again, I'm not a huge benchmarks guy, but that is a pretty respectable score. If you compare it to the HX90G, you can see it's about 100 points higher. Now for me, I always find that practical use is more important than benchmarks, so let's get into that. To start, one of the things I like to do is to do a video editing test. What I do is I take one of my older videos and then I crunch it up a bunch and move things around, then add all sorts of effects until I get a one minute video. From there, I'm gonna export it using the standard 1080p YouTube standards of 60 frames per second. And then I like to look at how long it takes to render altogether. For me, it's a win if it can edit the video in under one minute. And as you can see here, it was a piece of cake for the HX99G. We actually rendered it in 29 seconds altogether. And so for me, that's an indication this is going to be a very good productivity machine, be it for video editing, photo editing, or maybe music production. But of course, this channel is about gaming, so let's go into that next. We're going to start with PC gaming and start with the easier games and work our way up. And we're also going to keep things to 1080p and see how we can max the performance from there. With the easier games like Hades, we're getting close to 600 frames per second at 1080p on high settings. And even something like a competitive shooter like Counter-Strike GO will get an average of about 150 to 200 frames per second. Moving over to more story-driven games, something like Bioshock Infinite can play at 1080p with very high settings and get a solid 60 frames per second. And if we crank up the settings to Halo Reach, we're going to get an average of about 150 frames per second here. I was also surprised to find that in Nightmare settings at 1080p, Doom Eternal runs like a champ. In fact, we're getting about 150 frames per second here too. And same story with Resident Evil 3 at 1080p with a mixture of medium to high settings for optimal performance. For this, I would say an average of 200 frames per second is not out of the question. Now granted for these games you're probably not going to want to play them at these high frame rates but it does give you an indication that you can probably play these games at 1440p and maybe even at 4k. For some of the games that are still hard to play by today's standards, something like Elden Ring, we can still play at 1080p with high settings and get 60 frames per second. And same thing with Control, which is harder to play at these higher settings but at 1080p medium settings we're getting 60 frames solid. Even games that I would consider to be previous benchmarks, something like Hellblade or Rise of the Tomb Raider, these can play at 1080p with high settings and still get very good frame rates here too. And then finally the games that I would consider to be the cream of the crop. These are going to be the games that came out in the last year or so that are relatively hard to play. These all play very well on the HX99G. If I keep everything at 1080p and high settings, I'm getting at least 60 frames per second and often more depending on the game. For me, this is an indication that you could play these games at 1440p, maybe have to drop down the settings to medium, but all the same, it's going to look great. It's really going to come down to what monitor you're using and what you prioritize. Do you like having a high resolution or a higher quality graphics? For me in this case, I think that 1080p on high settings just looks the best, and so that's probably what I would play myself. Now you may be wondering, well Russ, the name of this channel is Retro Game Core. You're only showing modern games. Let's do some retro stuff. And your wish is my command. So we're going to start with some emulation, but we'll start with GameCube and move our way up from there just because everything else is going to play like a dream. And honestly, even GameCube plays really well. For example, here with F-Zero GX, I'm playing at a 6x resolution. That's actually a little bit higher than 4K, but as you can see, it's running smooth as butter. And so I'm very comfortable in saying here that you can play any GameCube game at a 5x resolution, but probably 6x for most. And the same can be said for Nintendo Wii using the same Dolphin emulator. Here I'm getting a solid frame rate with Kirby's Epic Yarn and Super Mario Galaxy 2 at a 5x resolution. So this is not quite 4K, but all the same, it's very close. And it's a similar story with PlayStation 2. For these really hard to play games like Burnout Revenge and even Champions of Norrath, I was able to play them at a 5x resolution. Now not all the games are going to play perfect like this. For example, God of War 2 played the best at a 3x resolution or 1080p. 
Either way, you're going to play every PS2 game here at at least 1080p, but most of them will be very close to 4K. Moving over to Nintendo Wii U, I also upped the resolution to 4K for certain games, and like with Wind Waker HD as well as Twilight Princess, these played at full speed. Now these natively played at 30 frames per second, but even the other Wii U games I played tested really well. A good example here is Zelda Breath of the Wild. I'm running this at a 1080p upscale, but then also I turned off the frame rate limit, and as you can see here, we're getting an average of about 75 or 80 frames per second. So this is gonna play Wii U, absolutely no issues here. Let's go ahead and move it up a little bit more to get to some of the systems that are harder to emulate. First, we'll try PlayStation 3, and this one also runs really well. For several games, I was able to play them at a 1080p upscale. That includes Dead or Alive 5, as well as Demon Souls. And each of these are playing at a full frame rate with no dips whatsoever. Now, many other games are not compatible with an upscale. It actually will break some games. And so with others like Devil May Cry, I had to drop it down to a native resolution. But even then, we're still getting a full frame rate with DMC. And the same can be said with Ridge Racer 7, as well as Prince of Persia. And so I'm comfortable in saying here that if a game plays well with the RPCS3 emulator, it's going to play well on the HX99G. In fact, even those higher tier of games that are hard to run, like Ratchet & Clank Quest for Booty, I was actually getting a relatively stable 60 frames per second, which is almost impossible with this game. It would dip down to about 58 frames per second here and there, but for me personally, I would call this a perfect gameplay experience. Next, let's try a couple of the problematic emulators. We'll start with Xbox using the Zemu emulator. We'll start with a 3x resolution with certain games like Crazy Taxi 3 and Dead or Alive 3. And I would say that the gameplay here is relatively smooth, but I did see some drops here and there. Either way, I would be comfortable playing it at 3x resolution right here. Now moving on to harder to emulate games like Halo 2, I was surprised to find here that this actually kept a pretty stable 30 frames per second. This game is notoriously hard to emulate on the Zemu emulator, but honestly, this looks pretty good. Now, personally, I would just play this with the Master Chief Collection on PC, but all the same, if you want to emulate the original, I think this is going to be worth it. But of course, it's not going to be perfect. For example, compatibility with the Zemu emulator still leaves a lot to be desired. And I was surprised to find that some games that usually play pretty well, like Panzer Dragoon Orta, actually struggled at a 2x resolution. So it's not going to be perfect Xbox emulation, but it's pretty darn close considering what we have to work with. Moving forward is the Xbox 360 emulator Zinnia. And I'm using the Canary build right here in a native resolution, but here I found pretty good performance as well. For the most part, your biggest issue is going to be compatibility because many games don't work with this emulator, but the ones that did kept a pretty stable 30 frames per second and maybe a dip down to 29 here and there. Either way, I would say games like Gears of War, Crackdown, and even Project Gotham Racing 4 are all going to be completely playable. Okay, moving on to the high tier of Nintendo systems, we'll start with Nintendo 3DS. Here I'm using the Canary build of Citra and we're going to run it at a 4x resolution. And this is just a little bit shy of 1080p on both of the two screens. And overall, we're getting some pretty good gameplay. I would get some dips here and there when shaders were caching, but other than that, yeah, I would say this is perfectly playable at a 4x. And then finally, we have Nintendo Switch emulation. For this, I just basically set it to docked mode and then tried to boot up every game as is. And like with 3DS, there would be some dips when shaders were caching, but other than that, once you had started to play for about 10-15 minutes, every game played well. In fact, even something like Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, which is usually really hard to emulate, does really well right here. Now there's a lot going on in the screen and I don't actually know how to play this game, but all the same, I would say that the gameplay mechanics are pretty smooth. So I think it's safe to say that on the Windows side, when it comes to emulation, you can play every single thing that has a Windows emulator. And not only that, for many of them, you're going to be able to upscale them up to something like 4K or close to it. Now, this isn't the only way to play emulated games. One of my favorite other ways to play it is through a Linux distribution called Botticera. Now, Botticera uses Emulation Station as its front end, and so it feels a lot like a gaming console when you have it all plugged up. And I have tutorial videos for this here on my channel. Either way, there are three things I like to test when it comes to Botticera. Number one is PS2. By default, PS2 usually runs a little bit worse than Windows. But I found that at a 4x resolution, PS2 played really well. So if you want to play 1080p or above on PS2, you can do that in Botticera. The other two tests I like to make are with Xbox and 3DS. I'm not sure what kind of magic is going on with Botticera, but these usually actually perform better than Windows. And as you can see here, Xbox is playing a lot better. We're getting a 4x resolution and it's playing at full speed. And same thing with Nintendo 3DS. We're actually getting a 6x resolution and it's still playing really well. And so if you wanted to use a USB flash drive to turn the HX99G into a gaming console, you could totally do that. And of course, you could pull out that flash drive and then use it for regular Windows things as well. 
And so with all the testing out of the way, let's go ahead and start wrapping things up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the HX99G. And as always, we're gonna start with what I like. Number one is the compact size. Now, of course, as far as mini PCs go, it's rather large, but when you compare it to a desktop PC, it is quite a bit smaller. And of course, as we saw in our testing, it has very solid PC gaming. We can actually get 1080p on high settings for just about anything you can throw at it. And then of course, when it comes to emulation, we can play most of those systems upscale to something very close to 4K. I also appreciate the fact that Minis Forum went back to the drawing board and improved the ports on the back. I think they probably got a lot of customer feedback over the fact that they would rather not have the display ports in favor of USB 4. And the fact that they gave two of those ports is pretty awesome. I'm also a big fan of the cooling solution we have here. In addition to the large heatsink and copper fans, we have liquid metal cooling. And I think all of that combined with a dual fan setup keeps everything very nice and cool and quiet too. Now, of course, there is always gonna be something I don't like about every mini PC, and there's a couple here. Number one, the truth is here that because we're getting desktop class performance, we're also getting getting a desktop class price. At the end of the day, if you were to get this with RAM and storage installed, you're looking at about $1,000. And for that amount of money, you can get quite a good desktop PC. But of course, the main draw here is it's gonna be a fraction of the size of one of those larger PCs. And so if space is at a premium for you, it is gonna come at a cost. And then finally, I'm just not a huge fan of the aerodynamic design that they're using with the HX line. And I totally get it. Some people like to have a PC that looks very gamery, but for me, I don't really like that. I like a more industrial design altogether. And so this may not be something that bothers you, but it was a nitpick for me. In the end, I think there's a lot to like about the HX99G, and this is probably one of the best mini PCs you can buy at this price point. Now, if you're really strapped for cash, you could get something like the HX80G, and that's gonna be quite a bit less expensive, but it is still gonna come with discrete graphics. And so when it comes to PC gaming, you should get some pretty good performance out of that one too. But I would say that the upgrades that are available in the HX99G, which includes a more powerful CPU and those two USB 4 ports on the back, means that this one's gonna last longer in the long run. In the end, you're probably wondering, do I recommend the HX99G? And I would say yes, I recommend it, but only for specific use cases. Number one, if you're looking to replace a full-size desktop PC and you don't want something as large, then I think this is gonna be a very good choice. I think if you go into this with the understanding that you can get more power for $1,000, but it's gonna come at a larger size premium, then yeah, the HX99G is gonna be a good product. And additionally, I do think it is worth that upgraded cost over the HX80G. After all, this one's gonna be more future-proof. However, if you're looking for a mini PC that's a little bit more value price, then you can definitely still get more bang for your buck at those smaller models. Now granted, you won't get the same level of performance, but all the same, you are gonna save a lot of money that way too. Either way, there's a lot of choices out there, and I'll leave my spreadsheet linked in the video description below so you can compare them against the others. But at the end of the day, I think the HX99G is a very good premium mini PC. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this the right price point for you, or would you prefer something a little bit cheaper and less powerful? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.